worship the King. He is risen, he is alive, and he goes by the name of Jehovah. So we're gonna worship him in the room today. We're gonna give him all the praise and all the glory that he is worthy of, because he is so worthy to be praised. Let's put our hands together, here we go.
such a good time There's nobody
our God. There's no rock like our rock. We thank you, Father, for your faith. Surrender it all I surrender it all Because of your love I give it all I surrender it all Because of your love 
Come on, sing now. No greater father, no greater healer, no greater love. You'll never leave me, never forsake me. You're always with me. Vision Church, you may take your seat. Please direct your attention towards the screen. Good morning, Vision Church, and welcome to Evans Auditorium. My name is Megan Sabin, and I serve as your Vision Kids Director. And I'm Juan Molina, your next-gen pastor. Over the next few moments, we want to share with you all that God is doing in our next generation. If you're a young adult, ages 18 to 30, we want to invite you to gather around. Gather on happens the first Friday of every month, and it's a powerful, intimate time of worship and a word specifically for young adults. Whether you're new to Charlotte or you've lived here your entire life, we'd love to help you connect and build community with like-minded young adults. Our next gathering is this Friday, April 5th at 7 p.m. Doors open at 6.30. Bring a friend, carpool if you can. We can't wait to see you there. If you're in middle school or high school, we want to invite you to our youth night. Every Wednesday night from 7 to 9 p.m., we have a time of fellowship, worship, and most importantly, a time to dive into the Word of God together. Our next youth night is April 10th, and we can't wait to see you there. Every Sunday at all five services, we offer Vision Kids. Vision Kids serves children ages newborn to fifth grade. Our mission is to partner with you parents to raise up soul winners and disciple makers. We do that by having worship, fun games, and most importantly, intentional and interactive lessons that help your children learn more about the gospel. The gospel is for everyone, no matter the age. I'm so excited to share with you all that this summer, from June 26th through the 28th, we will be having our very own Vision Kids Camp from ages preschool to fifth grade. To stay connected and for more exciting details to come, please head over to visionchurch.com slash events. Despite the world's claims of our generation being lost and broken, we are witnessing God's transformative power at work. In Jesus Christ, we find freedom, hope, and a new beginning. Right now, we're going to be led in worship by our very own Vision Kids Choir. So why don't you make some noise as we welcome them to the stage.
Welcome to Vision Church. Happy Resurrection Sunday. We're so excited that you're here with us today. My name is Emily and I serve on the admin team. And my name is Marty and I serve as your discipleship pastor. Over the next few moments, we'd like to share some things happening here at Vision that you need to know about. Absolutely. Now the Bible is a miracle. It's the best selling book of all time. And it's not just a book, it's a library. The Bible is the foundation of our faith and it is God's message to each of us. And if we're being honest, it can be a little difficult to understand whether you've been a Christian for 30 years or for 30 minutes. Reading and studying the Bible can be a challenge. Absolutely. Where do I start? How do I understand the context? How do I apply the scripture in my life? How do I teach the Bible to others? On Sunday, April 14th, Pastor Tyson is beginning a brand new series titled Unlocking the Bible. Throughout this series, you're going to be equipped with the tools you need to study and understand the Bible on a whole new level. You're also going to learn how to prepare a message to teach others. This series is going to be a game changer. Our church is located about 10 minutes away at 1134 West Boulevard. And we have five services every Sunday at 8, 9.30, 11, 12.30, and 5 p.m. Our church is growing exponentially and we will soon be one church in two locations. Our second campus at 6070 East Independence Boulevard in Charlotte is currently under construction and will launch the first of two phases this summer. Phase one will include a 400 seat sanctuary, Vision Kids classrooms, the parking lot, and staff offices. Our mission is the Great Commission, to win souls and make disciples. We're transforming this space so that lives will be transformed in it. The first commandment to every Christian is to be baptized. The Bible says in Acts 22, 16, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. Our next baptism is on Sunday, April 14th. You can sign up to be baptized right now at visionchurch.com slash events. If you feel led to give, there are three ways to give here at Vision Church. Online at visionchurch.com, text any amount to 84321, or in person at one of the giving stations in the lobby. Now let's pray over the offer. Father God, I just thank you for this day that we can come together and celebrate uh, Jesus' resurrection. We thank you for that. We pray over those who are giving. We pray that you would bless them. We pray over the offering. We pray that this would be used to reach your people, that it would expand the kingdom, that it would do the Great Commission to win souls and make disciples. We thank you for what you're going to do, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. You know what time it is. It's time for a one-minute mingle. You've got 60 seconds to get up out of your seat to say hello to the people around you, make some lunch plans. Your one-minute mingle starts right now.
Vision Church, would you stand with us as we continue to worship Jesus? Jesus, who is risen, he is risen indeed. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you'd be glorified in this place today. For you have the name that is above every name, that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. stars they wept, the morning sun was dead, the Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, His blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon me. Heaven loved me, the Son of God is made in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken.
somebody and bless his name this is the day that we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ this is the day that we are reminded that death has been defeated and because of Jesus Christ death is no longer our enemy it no longer needs to be feared by any born-again Christian because now Death has been disarmed, and all death can do is merely usher us from life to life everlasting. Come on, somebody, one more time, and praise him like you mean it. He's a good God and worthy of our highest praise. On your way to your seat, why don't you high-five your neighbor and tell them they're looking good. High-five them like you mean it. I want to take a second to welcome everybody online. Let's give it up for everybody watching on live via the broadcast. Welcome to Charlotte, North Carolina and Ovens Auditorium. We're honored that you're tuning in with us. I want to encourage you to engage with us in the comments section. Let us know where you're watching from. And don't forget to hit share on the broadcast because you never know who might be impacted by the message of the gospel. <clears throat> if you have your Bible, Turn with me today to John chapter 19, beginning in verse 38. John chapter 19, beginning in verse 38. While you're turning there, can we give it up one more time for this incredible team and choir who led us in worship today? Y'all are a blessing, a blessing. We are spoiled at Vision Church. Let me, I'm just excited. I go to church with these people, all right? So... Today, I want to talk to you about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus from an unusual perspective, from the vantage point of Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea is a conspicuous character in the scripture, yet all four gospels record his life. John chapter 19, verse 38. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. 
With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Following the Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. The place of crucifixion was near a garden, and there was a new tomb never used before. And so, because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Pray with me now. Father, we come to you today, this Resurrection Sunday, in the precious name of Jesus. I ask right now that you would make ready the hearts of your people to receive the word of truth. Bring your word to life right before our eyes. Change our hearts, our lives, save souls today, Lord, and be strong in the midst of my weakness. May my life and this ministry forever be hidden behind the message of the cross. We are here to exalt one name, and it's the name of Jesus. It's in Christ's mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Little background into the life of Joseph of Arimathea. Do you realize that he was a Pharisee? I don't know how much you know about Jesus, but Jesus and the Pharisees didn't get along too well. In fact, Jesus didn't have many enemies, but the Pharisees were certainly one of them. But Joseph of Arimathea was more than just a Pharisee. He was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, which was the highest council of the Hebrew people. In fact, it was the very council that betrayed Jesus and condemned him to die on a criminal's cross. Historians tell us that Joseph of Arimathea was likely not present during that vote of betrayal or else he would have voted against betraying Christ. Joseph, according to the scripture, was not only a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, but he was very wealthy and powerful. Scripture, though, calls him a righteous man, a good man. But most importantly, Joseph of Arimathea is known for taking the body of Jesus down off of that rugged cross, carrying his body to his own tomb and lying Jesus there in the tomb that was meant for him. The name of today's sermon is, He Took My Place. Tell your neighbor like you mean it, say, He Took My Place. (laughs) Over the next few moments, we're gonna work our way through John chapter 19, and we're gonna examine the life and role of Joseph of Arimathea. The first thing I wanna draw your attention to is that Joseph was a secret disciple. Sounds like a contradictory statement, doesn't it? To be a secret disciple, a secret follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet that's exactly how scripture portrays him. The Bible tells us that a secret disciple was someone who suppressed his faith. He hid his faith and he cowered away. But the Bible tells us in John's gospel, the real reason that Joseph of Arimathea was a secret disciple, it was because he feared men. The fear of men had gripped his heart and usurped a fear for God. Joseph being very wealthy, prominent, and powerful had much to lose. You have to understand in this time period, if you came out and professed faith in the Lord Jesus. That was putting a target on your life, let alone being a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a secret disciple because he feared men. I wanna read to you a scripture from Proverbs 29, 25, and this is what it says. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. 
Proverbs tells us that the fear of men is a snare to our life. When you fear men, you suppress your faith. When you fear men, you compromise your values. You compromise your faith. You want to fit in and be accepted. When you have a fear of men, you don't want to offend anybody. But I want to warn you that you cannot please man and God. You're going to have to choose. Jesus warned his disciples, if you want to follow me, the world hated me and it will hate you too. Think of it for a moment. Jesus Christ, the eternal preeminent creator of heaven and earth, the prince of heaven, stepped down from the right hand of the Father and put on flesh and became human and dwelt among us. And the very world that he created did not receive him. There was no place for him in Bethlehem. The world that he came to save hated him, despised him, and nailed him to a rugged cross. Make no mistake about it, that if Jesus were here in the flesh again, we would crucify him all over again. The world hated Jesus then, and the spirit of the age still hates him today. He warned you, if you want to be my disciple, the same world that hated me will hate you too. You have to count the cost of following after Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea wanted to be a secret disciple. The fear of man in our lives is a snare. Proverbs tells us that it is a snare to our soul. I want to read to you another proverb, chapter 9, verse 10, which says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom, then the fear of men is the beginning of all foolishness. Many of us sit in this room today and we can look down our noses at Joseph of Arimathea and say, how could you be a secret disciple? How could you be ashamed? Yet the truth is many of us in this room today are just like him. We believe, but we are still ashamed. We follow, but from a distance. We love his teaching, but we're ashamed to worship him and profess him openly. Let me tell you something. You've got to get over the fear of men. You've got to die to it because it's keeping you from God's plan and purpose for your life. Let me tell you this. The fear of men cost Joseph of Arimathea dearly. Suppressing his faith cost him the opportunity of a lifetime. What I mean by that is for three years, Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God, walked on earth, healing the blind, cleansing the lame, causing even Lazarus to get up from the grave. And Joseph could have been there to see it all unfold. This was the golden age of human history. Yet Joseph of Arimathea missed it because of the fear of men. It drove him into the shadows. And instead of being alongside Jesus through the duration of his ministry, he hid for fear of the Sanhedrin. If you allow the fear of men, you want the affirmation of the world, you will miss what God wants to do in and through your life. The fear of man caused him to miss the will of God and it will do the same to you. Look at your neighbor, the one you've been ignoring and tell him with some attitude, don't be afraid. I want to remind you that the scripture says that the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Anybody thankful that he didn't give us a spirit of timidity or fear? Secret disciples in this place today, come out of your shadow. Be bold and into the light. Follow Jesus 
in this moment and in this hour. Jesus Christ died for us openly. May we not live for him secretly. Let's live our faith for Jesus. Luke 9, 26 says this. If anyone is ashamed of me and my message, the son of man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory and in the glory of the father and the holy angels. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me here and now, I will be ashamed of you. But any person who acknowledges me on earth, I will acknowledge you in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. The next thing I want to show you is that Joseph's life changed at the cross. Help me preach. Tell your neighbor the cross changes things. At the cross, Joseph of Arimathea was transformed from a secret disciple into a bold witness for the Lord Jesus. Before the cross, he was a secret disciple, suppressing his faith, afraid to acknowledge Christ before his peers. But something magnificent happened at the cross. On that hill called Calvary, as he lifted his eyes towards Jesus, the suffering Messiah, something transformed in his heart eternally. And there was a boldness that rose up inside of him. And Joseph went from Calvary straight into the court of Pilate and demanded the body of Jesus. And by the way, not just anybody could waltz into the court of Pilate unannounced. This shows you the prominence, the influence that Joseph of Arimathea possessed. He walked right into Pilate and demanded the body of Jesus. The gospel of Luke tells us that when he did this, he took a risk presenting himself to Pilate. Because again, friends, you have to understand that to stand before Pilate and say, give me the body of Jesus, you were literally saying, I'm one of his. The very man you crucified, I believe in him. I'm with him. Joseph standing before Pilate literally put a target on his life, both from Rome and the Jews. This is a transformed man after he experienced the cross. The cross still changes lives. That's all right, you can praise him. <clears throat> Another amazing thing happened at the cross. The disciples who walked with Jesus for three years at Calvary, they scattered. But those who believed in secret came forward. Peter, the bold, boisterous disciple who said, I'll never deny you at Calvary, nowhere to be found. James, Bartholomew, the other disciples, they all scattered in fear. But those like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, something happened to them at the cross and they became the bold witnesses. And they not only stood before Pilate, but they took the body of Jesus down from the cross. Something changed in these men. Now church, don't miss it. Don't miss it. At Calvary, both Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea they were both Pharisees. Remember, the Pharisees were the enemies of Jesus. At the cross, his enemies became his sons. His adversaries became his advocates. The cross still has the power to transform the human heart from an enemy to a son. I'm gonna say something that may be alarming to you. Every person in this auditorium today and every person online, you fall into one of two categories. You are either God's enemy or you are his son. There's no in between. You're not his third cousin. You're not his random acquaintance. Like you are either his son or his enemy. Jesus said, those who aren't for me oppose me. Their way of life, their way of thinking and living 
opposes the work of the kingdom. Every person in this room today, you're in one of two categories, and I wonder, are you an enemy or are you a son? And let me tell you, it's not just enough to give God lip service. Everybody in the Bible belt says, oh, I'm a Christian. But Jesus warned that on the day of judgment, many would call me Lord, Lord, and I'll say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Talk is cheap. What are the actions and the behaviors and the decisions in your life? What do they say about where your heart really is? You know, in America, everybody wants a savior. Everybody wants to be forgiven for the consequences of our sin. And everybody wants to go to heaven. But very few want a Lord to obey and follow. Let me tell you on this Resurrection Sunday, he's not just Savior, he's Lord. And if you're still reigning as the Lord of your own life, you are an enemy of God. And the truth is we've all been enemies of God at some point in our life. But make no mistake about it, we all fall in one or two categories. But hear me today, if you walked into this room as an enemy, living a selfish, self-centered life as the God of your own life, let me tell you, at the cross today, everything can change and be made new. And just like he transformed Joseph, he can change you. The cross has never lost its power. And the gospel of Jesus Christ still works. It is the hope of humanity. At the cross, former things pass away and all things become new. At the cross, the addict becomes free. At the cross, marriages are restored. At the cross, sinners become saints. At the cross, we become a new creation in Christ Jesus, and we find true purpose and meaning for our life. Listen to me, you are created in the image and likeness of God Almighty, and apart from him, you will always be unfulfilled in life. It's not until you turn to him and trust in him that you truly find the purpose and the meaning for living. The next thing I wanna show you is that Joseph was emboldened by the night. Tell your neighbor, he was emboldened by the night. And that sounds like a little bit of an odd point, but I want you to see the significance of it. On Calvary's cross, as darkness was encroaching, there became a heightened urgency to remove his body from the cross. The Jewish day began at night, at darkness. And at darkness became the Sabbath, Passover, Saturday. As darkness crept in over Jerusalem, both Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea experienced a renewed urgency to deal with the body of Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite preachers of all time, said this, some flowers only bloom in the darkness like a primrose. May we blossom at night. May we flourish in the darkness. Anybody knew that? That there's some flowers that only bloom at night? I didn't know that. But it's a powerful image because in the darkness of the hour in which we live, May we not shrink back, but may we lean in. In the darkness that surrounds us, may we flourish and may we thrive spiritually. And friend, make no mistake about it, you're living in a dark world and in a dark day. The prophets of old foretold this day that we would live in. Isaiah said there would be a day when men would call good evil and evil good. You're here. The night is upon us. So may we live urgently and may we truly be about the Father's business. 
the days of going through the motions and giving empty-hearted confessions of Christianity, they're over. May we be all in today. May we live with a true passion and urgency and zeal for Jesus today. And may we not just honor him with our mouths, but may we honor him with our lives. You're living in the night, whether you realize it or not. Our world today is marked by fear, perversion, and confusion. Second Corinthians chapter four, four tells us that Satan is the God of this world and he is bind, he's blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. I find it hilarious in 2 Corinthians 4 that Satan can't even get a capital G in the Bible. He's the lowercase God of the world. Anybody else think that's funny? Anytime we can make fun of Satan, it's a good day, okay? But in all seriousness, the Bible is warning you. The scripture is putting life into context. It's telling you that Satan is influencing every sphere of society. Look around. He's influencing politics. This isn't a political sermon, but whatever side of the aisle you're on, you know it's true because everybody thinks the other side's the devil. (laughs) He influences politics, media, music, entertainment. The world glorifies sex, violence, rebellion. It's obvious to see that there is a spirit in the world that is infiltrated and influencing humanity. And the scripture says that is Satan. You're living in darkness. But hear me, church. Don't let the darkness discourage you. Because in the darkest night, the light shines the most brilliant. And there's just a little piece of me that when the world gets darker, just gets a little bit excited because I know that the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ can now pierce this world in a way that they couldn't see it before. Don't be discouraged or distracted by the darkness. Realize, let's be emboldened by it and let us recognize this is our hour. God put you on planet earth in Charlotte, North Carolina for such a time as this. God did not trust this moment in history with David, Isaiah, Zechariah, or any of the prophets of old. He trusted it with you. So what will you do with it? Will you shrink back? Will you cower in fear? Or will you be emboldened by the darkness, flourish, blossom in the night, and be a witness, a testament of the gospel and the saving power of Jesus Christ? Use your voice, your influence, your life to point the world to Jesus. You know, for so long, Christians have wanted to curse the darkness instead of just simply be the light. You don't walk into a room and say, I rebuke the darkness. You just turn on the light. (laughs) Yet it amazes me how many of us, we get so upset and so distraught and distracted by the world being the world. Stop cursing the darkness and be the light. And I'm going to tread into dangerous territory here, but by my facial expression, you can tell I'm perfectly fine. I've heard a lot of Christians all up in arms. Can you believe that society is declaring Easter a transgender day of visibility? Can you believe it? And they're like, did he say that at Easter? Yeah, I did. Um, can I be honest with you? I get the self, the, the, the righteous indignation. But let me be honest with you. It's just the world being the world. It's the darkness Be in the darkness, all right? Now listen, let's not get mad at sinners for being sinners. Let's love the world. Let's pray for the world. Let's be emboldened to stand for Jesus. Listen, sinners are not the enemy. They are our mission. 
And the last time I checked, when you read the Bible, Jesus was angry with the religious crowd and he had compassion on the sinners. <laughs> I know you don't want to clap, but I'm telling you, it's true. So, so hear me. Take the frustration and turn it to compassion. Pray the prayer Jesus prayed on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. May we actually be burdened for lost people. May we actually care and love a world that is lost without him. Don't get mad. Be bold. Be the light. Don't curse the darkness. And by the way, we're all sinners. Last time I checked, the Bible said in Romans 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You in the church, we like to name about three sins and just point at them. Transgender, homosexuality, you name it. But let me just remind you that gossip is a sin too. Oh, I'm pre You're like, I didn't sign up for this Easter sermon. Well, it's a, I've already died to me long ago, so I don't care what you think about me. So, and that's dangerous in a good way. We want to point out the sins that are external that we can see, yet we live with lust reigning and ruling in our hearts. Oh, well, I didn't cheat on my wife. Yeah, but you thought about it. Jesus said, if you've even looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you're guilty. You know, the Pharisees, they, were, they felt good about themselves. They were like, well, you know, I haven't coveted, I haven't committed adultery or murder. And Jesus is like, uh, yes, you have, in your heart. You know, Jesus is not trying to condemn us, but he's trying to expose our sinfulness. Because only when we realize how sinful we are will we then turn to a savior and redeemer. You see, so long as you think you're good, you're missing it. Jesus said, I came for the sick, not for the healthy or those who think they are righteous. The Pharisees heard that and they're like, well, you know, he came for the poor, you know, the alcoholic, the drug, you know, he came for them, not me, I'm good. Whew, right over their head. We're all sinners, just not everybody knows it. We're all sinners, just not everybody admits it. And when you point out the sin in your neighbor's eye, the speck in their eye, it just convicts you of the log in your own. So can I help you? We all need Jesus. We all need his mercy. We all need his blood. We all need the cross. By the way, the world can declare and decree whatever holiday they want to, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, all right? We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to bless the Lord. And uh, God is still God, and he still reigns in victory. Don't let the darkness discourage you. Make the darkness embolden you. Be a true Christian today. Do you realize that the church of Jesus Christ is truly the last great light shining on earth. And I know the church has its imperfections. Well, the church is imperfect because I pastor it and you go here. <laughs> you know, but hey, listen, it's not about the church being perfect. It's about Jesus being perfect. And the last time I checked, it's the church that needs a savior. It's the world that needs a savior. That's why he came. But in spite of our flaws and weakness, the local church is still God's plan to save the fallen world. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill, a light in the darkness. So let your light shine before men. Don't be a secret disciple. Don't suppress your faith or believe from a distance. All we have are these 77, 80 years on earth that the Lord has given us. You can spend your life any way you want to, but once you spend it, you can never take it back. Use your days for his kingdom, for his sake. Point the world to Jesus with your life. Everything else you spend your time and money and effort and energy on, it's not going with you. 
No matter how much money you acquire, it's not coming with you. The only thing you take to heaven are the souls that you point to Jesus. By the way, another reason to be urgent about the mission of Christ is because in heaven, you're not gonna get to do any more ministry. There's no more people to save. There's no more gospel to preach. The only opportunity to do the ministry is right here and right now. So leverage your life for his sake. Half a golf clap, but they're right. <laughs> Almost done today. Somebody that's hungry said amen. But <clears throat> I want to show you in verse 42, the Bible says that Jesus was crucified during Passover. Tell your neighbor, it was during Passover. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I just want to touch it very briefly because it's right in our text today. Do you realize that the Feast of Passover was celebrated annually by the Hebrews and it commemorated God's deliverance from Egypt and slavery where the Hebrews were oppressed for 400 years? But the thing about Passover that was so special is during the festival, they were commemorating how they were saved from the spirit of death that passed over the land of Egypt. Y'all remember Moses went to Pharaoh and he said, let God's people go. And Pharaoh hardened his heart and said, forget it. And then plague after plague fell on the land until the final plague was the death of the firstborn. You remember that? What did the Lord tell Moses? He said, you tell my people to take a lamb without spot and blemish, slaughter the lamb and take the blood of the lamb and spread it over the doorpost of your dwelling. And at midnight, when the spirit of death comes over Egypt, your houses will not be touched. They will be spared by the blood of the lamb. Now remember, this was an annual feast, an annual celebration. And it was taking place in Jerusalem at the same time that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who was slain from the foundations of the world, was led down the Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross, nails driven through his hands and feet, the Lamb without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, the sinless Son of God who takes away the sin of the world, was being lifted high on a cross, a sacrifice for sin once and for all time, literally during the Passover as the priest prepared the lamb for slaughter. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he told his disciples, behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. You see that ancient feast all along was pointing forward to our ultimate deliverance. Yes, the Hebrews were slave saved from slavery in Egypt and Pharaoh. But our lamb saved us from an enemy far greater called sin and death. We were born of a sinful nature, deserving the wrath of God. But Jesus Christ, our high priest, offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Anybody grateful for the blood of Jesus today? Thank you, Lord. And I'm closing now so you can say amen. <laughs> Final thing I want to show you is in Matthew 27, 59. This last point is simply this. He took my place. Matthew 27, 59. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth and he placed it in his own tomb, which had been carved from the rock. I want you to feel this for a moment today. And I would encourage you all to lean in and let this text, let it speak to you and resound inside of your spirit. Joseph of Arimathea 
literally took the body of Jesus down from the cross. You know, in church, we talk a lot about the cross, talk a lot about the resurrection, but very seldom do we pause to think about the space in between. You see, the significance here is that had Joseph not intervened, the Romans had two ways of dealing with crucified criminals. Number one, after they died, they would often just leave the body on the cross, exposed to the elements to decay and even the vultures to tear at their flesh. The other way that they would deal with the body is they would take it down from the cross and they would discard their bodies in a common grave outside the gates of Jerusalem. That was likely the result, what was coming for the body of Jesus, except for that man, Joseph of Arimathea, who said, give me his body and I'll take it. I want you to feel this for a minute. As Joseph of Arimathea takes the body of Jesus down from the cross, you have to remember that his body had been beaten beyond all recognition. He was bloody and disfigured, his body lacerated. He died a death of asphyxiation. This was gruesome beyond anything you could imagine. As Joseph took the body of Jesus down from the cross, undoubtedly he was covered himself now in the blood of Jesus. And I wonder in that moment, I wonder, Joseph, did you know that the blood that stained your garments was the blood that atones for the sin of the world. Joseph, I wonder, did you know that when you carried that body that you were holding the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world? Joseph, I wonder, did you know that as you held that body, you were literally fulfilling the ancient Messiah prophecies of old that said that he would die among the wicked and be buried among the rich. I wonder, did he realize that the lacerations across his body were for him? Imagine Joseph putting the body of Jesus in his own tomb. Thoughts had to be racing through his mind as he saw Jesus lying in his tomb. He had to think to himself, that should have been me. He had to be thinking, this is the death I should have died and this is where I should have been buried. He took my place. But not only did Jesus take my tomb, oh, he took my cross. You see, friends, the cross was meant for you and me. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us deserve hell, eternal separation from God. We deserve the wrath of God Almighty, the cross and its torment. That was what we deserved. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but find life everlasting. Jesus didn't die for the religious elite or for those who are worthy or for those who are good enough. Jesus didn't just die for those who sinned a little bit less than others. No, he died for any and every whosoever would accept him and call upon his name. He died for you. God treated his son like the wicked so that he could treat the wicked like his sons. He who knew no sin became our sin on the cross that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took our place, that cross we deserved. But thanks be to God, on that cross he cried out, it is finished. The, the price has been paid. The debt satisfied. The wrath quenched. It is finished. 
There's nothing more to earn, nothing more to prove, nothing, no striving, no straining, no nothing. We are saved. Our salvation is not a reward for the righteous. It's a free gift to sinners. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. I want you to hear me in this room. Every person in this building, whether you are an atheist, agnostic, unbeliever, or a secret believer, I want you to know that God loves you. He doesn't want any to perish. It's his will that all would be forgiven and saved. Listen, there's only one way to heaven. Only one. You say, well, that's, that's narrow-minded. No, nobody else died for you. Muhammad didn't die for you. Buddha didn't die for you. All the prophets of all the other world religions, nobody else took your place. Nobody else died for you. And nobody else had the power to lay down their life. And on the third day, take it back again. Our story doesn't end in the tomb. You see, there is a tomb in Jerusalem that holds no body, it is empty. And that empty tomb validates every sermon Jesus preached. It validates every lesson he ever taught, every title he assumed. That empty tomb is our blessed assurance that he has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And a God who can save himself is a God who can save you. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to place my faith in the hands of a prophet who was unable to save himself. Think about it. Only Jesus. Neither is there salvation in any other name, for there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus. Trusting in Jesus is where true life begins. Former things pass away and all things are made new. I want you to pray with me all over this place. If you're in this room today, you're either an enemy or you're a son of God. There's no in between. If you're not living with Christ as the God of your life, if you don't love Jesus first and you don't love Jesus the most, it's idolatry. Don't deceive yourself. Repent of your sin and turn to Jesus. He loves you. He wants to save you and take away the sin of the world. Pray with me now all over this place. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus and we humble ourselves right now and we confess that we are sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God. Our life has been marked by lust, pride, greed, and selfish ambition. We've lived as the God of our own life. We've loved things created more than the creator himself. And today we ask you for mercy and for forgiveness. We believe in this moment that 2,000 years ago, you sent your one and only son to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless life. He died on the cross in my place. It was my sin, my transgression that he carried. He died, was buried, and on that third day, he rose again from death to life. He is the resurrection and the life. And today, Lord, I place my faith, my soul, in your hands. Make me a new creation this day. And may I live for you and serve you all the days of my life. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Now in just a moment, I'm gonna invite you to do something bold. In a moment, I'm gonna to count to three. And if you prayed that prayer with me today, for the first time, or you prayed it as a recommitment of your faith in Jesus. At the count of three, I'm gonna invite you to stand.
publicly and boldly. I'm not going to embarrass you or single you out, but we're not going to remain in the shadows and our faith is not going to be a secret. We're not going to suppress the truth. If we would acknowledge him on earth, he will acknowledge us in heaven. In every person Jesus called to follow him, he called them to do so publicly. You cannot be ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. Is there anybody here today that that's you? If that's you, I want you to stand right now. One, two, three. See you, my brother. See you, my sister. Oh my, I see you all over the place. Okay, those of you standing, just remain standing just for a moment. Those of you that are standing, if you would just remain standing just for a moment. Um, My goodness. Thank you, Jesus. Even in the balcony, people standing all over. Thank you, Jesus. Now, those of you that are standing, I just want to talk to you from the heart just for a moment. Please remain standing. In just a minute, a member of our prayer team, they're going to give you a decision card. Please take a second to fill that out and return it back to us before you leave today because we just want to connect with you, follow up with you, and answer any questions you may have. But I also want to congratulate you on the greatest decision that you could ever make in your lifetime. Your faith is an inspiration to me and every person in this building because it takes faith, humility, and courage to stand in an auditorium like this and say, I need you, Jesus. But the scripture says, blessed are the poor in spirit, the humble at heart, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. I want to pray for you now. And all of, all of you, if you're sitting near somebody, stretch your hands towards them and let's pray over these precious people today. Father, right now, we give you praise for these precious people who have stood in faith today to declare you as the Lord of their life. I pray, Father, that no weapon formed against them would ever prosper, that you would be the author and the finisher of their faith. What you have begun today, let it come to fruition. All the days of their life, may they serve you and walk with you and follow you. Lord, be glorified greatly through their lives and multiply their faith into the world that is dark and lost without you. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Vision Church, let's give the Lord praise one more time for his goodness and his faithfulness. He is worthy.